Describing history in basic, binary terms has been shown to be foolish time and time again. There's nuance to history that cannot be represented by something as simple as good versus evil or right versus wrong. Instead, there's complexity that needs to be explored. So why is it that we often lose so much of that nuance and complexity when we talk about the Second World War? There is a factual basis for this broad stroke history, and this is perhaps why we find it easier to talk so imprecisely about World War II. The death camps of Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen and Treblinka, for example, fill us with revulsion as they should. The battalions who liberated those camps and those who suffered unimaginable horrors at the hands of their captors are on the right side of history, the good side. But this idea of right and good versus wrong and bad falls apart a little when we extend it across the whole conflict or when we expand it to other perspectives. The march of Imperial Japan across the Pacific, for instance. Bad, certainly for the European and American powers with colonial stations and military bases there, but what about the people who were from there? The people who had endured decades or even centuries of colonial rule before the World War reached the Pacific. Does this lead us to Japan's most critical World War II mistake? A failure to smash the shackles of colonial rule in Asia. By essentially ousting one colonial power and installing another in its place, did Japan sow the seeds of their own downfall in the Pacific theater? And could it have been any different? December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy according to President Roosevelt. The surprise attack on the American fleet at Pearl Harbor. But this was no invasion. This was a raid, a taste of the might of the Imperial Navy. Almost simultaneously, Japanese forces landed in Thailand, which fell only five hours later. The first colonial territory to come under attack was Malaya, where three Japanese infantry divisions landed at Kotabaru, driving the defending British and Australian troops out. HMS Prince of Wales and HMS Repulse will be sunk off Malaya in the coming days. Hong Kong, also administered by the British, would be next, although the territory held out for three weeks before falling on Christmas Day. On December 19th, the British-held territory of Penang fell under Japanese control. The swift advance of the Japanese was now threatening the entirety of British Malaya. As 1942 dawned, the situation was bleak for the Allied powers and their colonies in the east. The Japanese had already added the American bases at Guam and Wake Island to their empire, and the Philippines was now under threat. Over the next two months, Britain's colonial territories would fall like dominoes as Malaya and Burma were overrun, culminating in the fall of Singapore on February 15th. Further south, the Solomon Islands also fell. Australian-administered New Guinea had mostly fallen too, putting Australia itself in the firing line. A decisive Allied naval defeat at the Battle of the Java Sea effectively put the whole Dutch East Indies under the Japanese yoke, compounding the woes of the occupied Netherlands. By May, the Philippines had surrendered. The Japanese Empire now stretched from northern China almost to Queensland. All, it seemed, was lost. Except, we know that all was not lost for the Allies. We know the story. We know about how the tide of war changed. We know about Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima and Okinawa and about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and about the Japanese surrender at Tokyo Bay in 1945. What is a little less well known and certainly less often discussed is what happened in the intervening years. What takes us from the sweeping victories of December 1941 to May 1942 to the capitulation and surrender of September 1945? To understand this, we may need to go back a bit further, or quite a lot further in fact, to 1931 and the invasion of Manchuria. A decade before Pearl Harbor, Japanese agents staged the Mukden incident as a pretext for invading and subduing Manchuria and northeast China. Manchuria was part of China's sovereign territory and was not a colonial holding, but still, there were other forces at work beyond simply Chinese versus Japanese. While the nationalist forces of Republican China, under the leadership of Tiang Shuliang, resisted the Japanese advance, the invading army utilized the former emperor Puyi, the final leader of the Qing Empire in 1912, 
me was still a boy, as a sort of puppet head of state. The idea was that a liberating army bringing about a return to the old ways of imperialism and traditionalism would carry more weight than that of an expansionist power in search of mineral wealth. The fact that the Qing imperial family, by 1932 the Manchukuo imperial family, or the rulers of the Manchurian Empire, were from the Mansu ethnic group and not members of China's Han majority, may have added to the complexity of the situation. On top of this, other ethnic groups in the region, from the Mongol people in the west of Manchuria to the white Russian people in the far northeast, may not have felt the same revulsion to an invading imperial army as those aligned to the largely hand Kuomintang government might have done. We'll never know whether Japan's system of governance in northern China would have been ultimately successful. The atrocities that would occur in other parts of China, such as in Nanqing and Shanghai, would harden Chinese and global sentiment against the Japanese invaders, while the American nuclear attacks and subsequent Soviet invasion would put an end to Japanese interests on the Chinese mainland for good. However, this idea of installing a puppet emperor, someone more palatable to the local populace, was a relatively successful one, at least in the short term. Strike to win, and only when success is certain. If it isn't, then do not strike. Would the Japanese use this model almost a decade later when they began to add to their empire elsewhere across the Pacific? Not really. The existence of a weak and ousted former emperor in China played directly into Japanese hands, and they used this to their advantage. They couldn't really do the same in Burma or in Malaya, where Japan's sworn enemies had held colonies for over a century. In Indochina, which had been overrun even before the outbreak of global conflict in the Pacific, the Japanese had used a more diplomatic approach, working with the colonial French forces rather than in direct opposition with them and continuing to do so until their withdrawal in 1945. But this did not help the indigenous population, who saw little change in their social standing. The Imperial Japanese forces maintained a semblance of continuity in the region, but the people themselves had nothing to get excited about. In fact, the presence of the Japanese would catalyze the growing resistance movement. Formed in China in 1941, the Viet Minh group would launch guerrilla attacks into northern Vietnam from 1943. Strike to win and only when success is certain. Viet Minh General Von Nguyen Giap would later say, If it isn't certain, then do not strike. Emboldened by the Japanese occupation, the group would continue these strikes throughout the remainder of the war and seized control of Hanoi after the Japanese defeat. This would be the first major victory in Vietnam's generations-long anti-colonial struggle. It would not be the last. It was very different in Burma. As British forces were driven out and local administrators fled into neighboring India, Japanese troops were greeted as liberating heroes by some sections of the population. The Japanese occupiers encouraged Burmese nationalists to form a government of their own, supporting Ba Mo as head of state with Aung San, father of future pro-democracy activist and politician Aung San Suu Kyi as war minister. But promises of independence eventually proved false and atrocities committed at the end of the war, such as the massacre at Kalagong, would raise the civilian death toll of the Japanese occupation to between 170,000 and 250,000. There were scenes like this in the Dutch East Indies as well, as indigenous groups saw an opportunity to break the centuries-old chains of colonial rule imposed by Europeans from a far-off land. But once again, such goodwill did not last. The Japanese may have been Asian like the indigenous Indonesians of the Dutch East Indies, but they were in no mood to liberate. Instead, they recruited Romusha, labor divisions, effectively slaves, and deported and detained people right across the vast archipelago. Around 4 million people, mainly indigenous Indonesians, died as a result of Japanese policies during their three years of occupation. So, if Japan's invasions across Southeast Asia and the South Pacific were greeted by some as a positive change, as a shift away from the Eurocentric colonial model toward a sort of pan-Asian unity, what changed? Why was the Empire of Japan unable to cement its gains in those early months of the war in the Pacific? One factor was a lack of autonomy for the conquered territories. This was never about ending colonialism, instead it was about enforcing a new form of colonialism one orchestrated from Tokyo rather than from London, Paris, Amsterdam or Washington. 
The Dutch East Indies and Burma may have felt an initial wave of optimism and opportunity at the arrival of the Japanese, but for Filipinos, the invasion put a spanner in the works of the developing independence movement in their country. Another factor may have been existing conflicts. In Malaya, for example, the local Malay and Chinese communities had been in opposition for decades, with differing cultural and political viewpoints leaving violence never far away. In the Philippines, the Islamic people in the south of the archipelago had been more than ready to fight Spanish and American colonial forces for the best part of 500 years, and it would take considerable diplomacy to prevent these groups from taking up arms against yet another invader. Whether it was through a lack of understanding, a lack of inclination, or simply just a lack of resources after finding themselves stretched thinly across a huge area, the Japanese administration was not able to claim these divisions. In the end, the consensus seems to have been that the Japanese overreached. They took on too much, too fast, and suppressing the millions of new colonial subjects within their empire while fighting a multi-front war at the same time ultimately proved too much. It's possible that, with a little more diplomacy, tact, and benevolence, things might have been different. By managing their sprawling empire rather than bringing it to a heel, Japan may have found itself in a very different position. But this did not square with the imperial ideology of racial superiority, nor does it take into account the formidable power of the American military industrial complex. A different approach may have bought the Japanese a little more time, but it seems unlikely that it would have won them the war. What do you think? Was this indeed a big Japanese mistake of the Second World War? Could it have been any different if they consolidated their power and ruled with a bit of compassion? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.